consumers are overloaded with ads in general on Instagram and Facebook, etc. So when they're ready to buy, building great digital shelves is really important. So we try and repurpose our content that we're doing on our website and with our retailers also for Amazon, and it complements that strategy. This is the e-commerce brain trust, a podcast about building momentum online for established consumer brands. Join our hosts and their expert guests for high-level conversations about e-commerce strategies, trends, and innovations. Access our brain trust and boost your brand's e-commerce potential. Hello and welcome to the e-commerce brain trust podcast. As I mentioned last week, I've had so many projects and workshops in New York and San Francisco and a a speaking engagement at the end of this month. (laughs) When I got on the mic, I had no idea what I was showing up for and I was just about to say hello, welcome to the Marketplace Institute. (laughs) But here we are, we're on the e-commerce brain trust podcast. Thank you for tuning in. And please excuse my scatteredness as I get through the month of September with all the crazy goings on with Bobsled, the Marketplace Institute, Amazon for CMOs, which we're just about to talk about. And of course, it is just prior to Q4, the most wonderful time of the year for all brand manufacturers. Welcome back to the show. Thank you again. So this week is the launch of my second book, Amazon for CMOs. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you would have heard all of the interviews that I did for this book, along with my co-author, Mark Power, who I teamed up with for this book to give a really robust, broad industry perspective on Amazon from a brand's perspective and from an executive's perspective. So this is the week. Amazon for CMOs is now live out in the world. It's available to get on Kindle as well as paperback and we'll link up to the show notes so you can find it on Amazon. But this is the week that you can get the Kindle version completely free. Download it, share it with your team, share it with your buddies that you uh, commiserate with about Amazon I would really appreciate you grabbing the book and spreading the word if you can um, on LinkedIn or elsewhere so that we get Amazon for CMOs into the hands of as many executives and teams that work with executives as possible. All of the information that we share in Amazon for CMOs, myself and Mark, who also runs an Amazon agency focused on brand building and media, this comes from our own direct experience over the last five years, each working with brands on Amazon. And we also called in 15, 20 different CMOs and executives from retail and retail companies and manufacturers to get their perspectives on Amazon, what's worked for them, how they've thought about things like organizational design, how they've thought about things like budgeting for innovation. And I'm really proud of how wide ranging and complete this book is for anyone that's looking to develop their Amazon strategy and most importantly, not just have the strategy, but get everyone on board who needs to be on board within your company. So today I'm going to rerun one of my favorite interviews that I did um, for researching this book with Michael Parnesh from Outward Hound the CMO of Outward Hound, which is a a house of brands in the pet care category. And Michael was the one who really crystallized for me this concept of Amazon as a microcosm of an organization. And he explains that quite eloquently in this interview, but I'll do my best to hack it and say that um, Amazon is not just a distribution channel. And if you're listening to this show, you probably you already know that Amazon is about marketing, it's about finance, it's about product, it's about brand, it's about customer service, it's about inventory planning. It's absolutely everything that you need, every function that you need in an organization, you need to have represented in your Amazon channel as well. And this is a very foundational and very critical thing that 
I see a lot of brands getting wrong is that Amazon is relegated to the digital team and the digital team doesn't have any sway within the organization to get more budget, to get better resources, to help with inventory planning, to get their warehouse on team with moving into the seller central model and being able to get more profitability and more more control out of the channel by being able to ship eaches. You know, there are, every organization has its own challenges and opportunities with Amazon, but the important thing is that whatever team or individual is in charge of Amazon understands that this touches every single part of your organization. So to give credit where credit's due, that concept, Michael Parnesh, thank you again for contributing that nugget to this book. And uh, I'm very pleased to be re-airing this particular episode so you can soak up more of Michael's wisdom as a very experienced marketer and leader. So once again, go to Amazon, grab the Kindle version of Amazon for CMOs. You'll get it for free this week only. And we are planning to launch also very soon an audible version of the book too. So you can listen to Amazon for CMOs in the car, at the gym, wherever you go. Doing When I'm doing the dishes, I'm always listening to audiobooks and podcasts just as a sneak peek into my life. Um, but yes, I would really appreciate if you grab the Kindle. What that means is that we get uh, like a good bump of um, sales quote unquote sales in the first week and we get a better ranking on Amazon. So I'm certainly taking everything I know about Amazon and <laughs> leveraging it with this book launch. But if you grab that book, it helps me and what would help even more and I would appreciate from the bottom of my heart is if you left a review of the book after you download it. And that is really going to help me get this into the hands of more people. Demystify Amazon at the executive level. We all want our executive teams to understand more about Amazon and what it means and why we need more budget and why we need everyone to get on board and why we need to be looking at the correct metrics. So by spreading the word, uh, we can get a little bit more sophistication and understanding at the executive level of these organizations and make our lives easier as interested Amazon parties. So we're going to run this interview with Michael Parnesh from Outward Hound. Thank you again for listening to the show and thank you in advance for supporting the launch of Amazon for CMOs. I'll catch you next week. So I'm here today with Michael Parnesh, who is the CMO at Outward Hound. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thanks, Gary. So it's great to have you on the podcast, Michael, because you're a current client of Bubsled Marketing and also someone who has had a great career as a marketing leader in the CPG space so far. I'd love for you to just tell us a little bit about your career background, how you've come to be at Outward Hound. Sure. Yeah, my background combines roles in marketing and product development in the toy industry for Hasbro and Mattel, in the agency world for McDonald's and Burger King, for baby products, Infantino and Diono. Did a little stint with a cookware company, Brand Tfal, to keep things interesting. And for the last years in the pet industry for Outward Hound. So Outward Hound is a family of brands in the pet care space. As you guys say, eight brands under one woof. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I had to get that right. So that's a lot of brands to keep track of. How do you, as the CMO of Outward Hound, keep on top of the brand, marketing, distribution channels, profit margins for all of those entities? Yeah, when I started five years ago, it was one brand. <laughs> it was Outward Hound. And in the perfect marketer's world, it would be one brand, one voice, one website, etc. And everything focused on that. Now that we are eight brands under one roof, it, it's interesting. You know, we're in all categories. So we're in toys, gear, treats, bowls. We also do cat toys and scratchers. But what's important is that we look at our KPIs for the business overall, you know, from an operation, finance, sales, and marketing lens. And this drives where we focus short and long term to achieve our goals for each brand. 
and the products within them. So basically, we do have a brand architecture and style guides, and that differentiates the brands, their mission, their personality, their voice, their purpose, their vocabulary, and what that design DNA is. So for example, Outward Hound's brand voice is fun, the tone is friendly, and the personality is social. Whereas Pet Stages, the voice is authentic, the tone is direct, and the personality is smart. And this all dovetails into our strategy for social, our retail channels, direct to consumer, which we also have e-commerce, of course, and Amazon. We are also both B2B and B2C, where we sell to distributors, retailers, e-commerce, and direct to consumer. Wow. So it's not even just eight brands, but you have B2B and B2C strategies as well. Yeah. So this is where channel management is definitely a key area of focus to manage that distribution and what channel with what products at what price (laughs) and how we will promote them. This is a case study basically in school right here with what we're doing. We want to both support our channel partners and always deliver great experiences with our products to the consumers and ultimately their pets. If the pets are happy, so are the pet parents. Got it. So e-commerce is obviously one of several distribution channels for you. You have brick and mortar retail, you have your e-com site, you have other, you have marketplaces like Amazon, distribution partners. When you're thinking about Amazon, which you're probably thinking about more and more as the years go by, where does Amazon live in the context of B2B distributors, all the other channels that, that you're handling? Amazon continues to gain more and more importance, you know, from one of your podcasts, Curie, the Feedvisor study with 89% of people more likely to buy from Amazon, 66% of people start their search on Amazon. We know they're the bottom of the funnel, but we also know that customers are going there and we ultimately need to be where our customers are. We do think both channels can exist, at least in the pet space, because we know consumers do go to stores typically to buy food. And during those kind of trips, they typically buy something else in the supplies area and hopefully one of our toys. But it's important to know that, I mean, even look at digitally native brands, you know, planning to open stores with Amazon, the pop-up stores and the Go stores and Casper and Warby Parker, you know, is getting close to 100 stores. So, you know, brick and mortar is still important. It still is, you know, a large majority of sales today, and those experiences are important. I think it's important that we also consider along the journey to buy something. We call it the four C's, connect, consider, convince, and convert. And we know Amazon is at the bottom of that funnel, and we need to be there. So those two main purchase drivers and need states of convenience and experiences is what Amazon does better than anybody Some of the retailers do a great job of one or the other, typically not both. And I think that's where Amazon is becoming more and more important. So you no longer need to go to multiple stores. Amazon is everything a click away. It's the best thing ever. A lot of us are customers. We know there's 100 million Prime members, and that's becoming bigger and bigger every day. We also know consumers are overloaded, you know, with ads in general on Instagram, Facebook, etc., So when they're ready to buy, building great digital shelf is really important. So we try and repurpose our content that we're doing, you know, on our website and with our retailers also for Amazon. And it complements that strategy. What kind of content do you repurpose for the Amazon channel? Is this user-generated content? It's not user-generated. So when we do, let's say, for example, we'll do a photo shoot, you know, we'll do lifestyle photos. We'll do studio photos as well. We will look at reviews and testimonials of our products on and off Amazon to see what questions people are asking. We try and put some of those questions and copy within images. So if you look at one of our detail pages on Amazon, for example, on a fun feeder bowl, you know, we'll talk about, you know, what the benefits are of that. And then we'll use that same content across ads. So we'll do a carousel ad on Facebook. You know, that sometimes will direct with a trackable link, hopefully to the detail page or brand store on Amazon. And then kind of that ecosystem of content complements kind of the Amazon ecosystem. Gotcha. So one of the things that you mentioned just now is the experience of a customer in the retail store compared with on Amazon and channel conflict is something that a lot of brands are concerned about when they have a brick and mortar footprint. Do you find, like, what's your retailer's reaction been to your continued investment in Amazon? Do they say that as a threat or are they seeing the the Amazon channel complement what they're able to offer in stores? Yeah, I mean, Amazon is real. It's not going away. (laughs) It's becoming bigger. In a perfect world, it wouldn't exist. Every store in the world would have a differentiated product from another store at a different price point. However, that's not the case. We do try and do that as much as possible. That pricing becomes really important in this world. 
and the channel management of having different products in those different channels. So you can't really compare the same exact ASIN or SKU in each channel. However, you know, a lot of retailers are also doing e-commerce sites, right? They have their own sites. So they're competing as well in that same space. So it does come down to really, again, that convenience and removing all the friction as possible because ship to store is becoming bigger than ever, right? Look at Walmart, look at Target, look at the grocery chains. Amazon's trying to do that with Whole Foods, obviously. So that is where they can win. The benefit we have in our vertical in the pet space is that a lot of stores allow pets to go with them, right? So it becomes an opportunity to actually bring the end customer in our world, right? To actually see and smell and try, you know, a treat or grab a toy and see if they like that. And that becomes an experience in itself that it's something to do with your pet to go to the store. So that is one opportunity we have. That's a great example of the channels being so complementary because if you have a dog and the dog loves it, loves a product in the store, you know, you're probably going to buy it that day. You know, you're not going to go home and, and then buy it on Amazon if you're seeing a really positive reaction from your end customer there. Absolutely. But the next time, you know, once the dog's worked its way through that treat or that toy, you might buy it on Amazon the next time. Exactly. And that's typically what happens. You know, it's trial in the store, yeah. you know, and that's not a bad thing. It's like taking your kids to the store and they're going to grab something. You're not going to say no 100 times. You might say it 99 times, but look at to pick one thing, right? Yeah. And it's typically <laughs> the same thing, you know, with your pet. Yeah. So um, I like the customer journey points that you mentioned before. Connect, consider, convince, and convert. So how do you, with, with connecting Kick us off with, like, what does that first stage look like, connecting? So connecting is basically discovery and awareness. For us, it's capturing people's attention during that path to purchase. But we want to connect on an emotional level as well, you know, not just what they need in that moment. And I think having a pet is a lifestyle decision. And there's also an emotional component that goes with choosing what to get. You see people dressing up their pets, (laughs) buying all kinds of toys, you know, trying different things because they love them. They're like their kids, right? And they treat them like that. In some cases, you know, they do a really good job treating their pets like kids, taking them to spas, etc. So, I mean, the pet market continues to scale and grow. So it's a huge opportunity to connect where people are. And that is in a lot of different spaces. So for us, you know, social becomes really important. And authentically delivering kind of messages and visuals and imagery, whether it is UTC, whether it's something that we create that content, that they can see that what exists for their pet and that there's testimonials of other pets using it and loving it and having a great time. And that's when they might go to Amazon, right, to see what the reviews are. And that's what hopefully acquires a new customer and hopefully increases that lifetime value over time. That's really interesting and a great way to start that relationship off, like you said, connecting on an emotional level because we're in a world where selling products, especially in the pet category, where there's not a, doesn't have huge barriers to entry like cosmetics or food, which are highly regulated industries. So there's a lot of, that seems to be escalating competition in categories like yours, where it's easy to set up an Amazon seller account. It's easy to buy stuff off Alibaba and flip it. And that's become sort of this whole new cottage industry. Do you, because you have the brand and you've got the developing a connection with customers, I suppose that that insulates you a little bit from that commoditization. But how do you view that commoditization as a threat to some of your brands? Yeah, that's a great point. You know, there's more and more of that commoditization. You know, we see it more and more on Amazon as a platform of 3Ps coming on there, you know, especially our top sellers. You know, you'll see all of a sudden the same products, you know, show up. Sometimes they use the same images as us, the same titles as us. So that becomes a whole brand registry thing. So make sure everyone listening does that when you first get on there. And that's just like a -a whack-a-mole, right? You you just have to deal with that. And that's, you know, also a form of flattery when things start becoming top sellers and Amazon's choice and best sellers and they have that little ribbon. You're going to get copied and you're going to get on there. You know, we had something the other day where on one of our detail pages as basically a child ASIN, a competitor got on there. So we had to file a case to get them off. But when you're running like a deal and a promo, in this case, it was a deal of the day and you had a competitor that just kind of, you know, got themselves on there, it becomes a problem short and long term. 
So again, that channel management, you know, the brand registry and protecting it and policing it and monitoring it daily, you know, is part of living with Amazon. And I think the other big thing is that as there's more private label and more commoditization and just kind of copies and, and knockoffs, it's really important for us to maintain and build the equity that we have with our brand and those products. So that brand store becomes, you know, really important and driving people there to hopefully increase that average order value and see what else they have from us. And then that's kind of drives some of our strategy where, you know, doing sponsored products is great, but, you know, sponsored brands and showing all the other things we have to get new customers and build that awareness is a great opportunity to build the brand on Amazon. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think that as as commoditization increases, I think we'll see a return to brands because I, for one, when I go to Amazon and I'm looking for a product that has a potential to be a commodity like electronics product, typically phone charger, keyboard, something like that, just the it's a swamp of junk on the first page. <laughs> I don't trust a lot of it. And I'm, I'm not alone in that if you're just looking at pages and pages of unidentifiable brands. I don't know if that company is going to be selling that same product tomorrow, if I could you know, get a refund, get any kind of support, things like that. So I'm searching more than ever for brands on Amazon because that's, you know, still after, you know, 100 years, a brand is still a marker of quality for the end customer. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think it will come back. I mean, you've seen, you know, the Walmart and Toys R Us when they were in business, along with other brands, do private label and then go back to brands. And I think in the world of the Ebays of the world, and obviously Amazon, and in our case, you know, there's some other ones. Uh, there's Chewy comes to mind. You know, there is going to be private label on there. And in a lot of cases, people, especially in our vertical of pets, may not go for the lowest price. They may pay more because it is the brand. It does have the quality. And guess what? There's a lot of kids in the houses that have pets. So a lot of times you might have a kid sticking in their mouth a pet toy. And you want to make sure that they're safe and non-toxic, et cetera. So I think that's another consideration set also when it comes to Amazon. Yeah, that's a great point. All right. So as a growing brand or multiple growing brands here, how do you balance the desire for growth and customer acquisition with the desire for line item profitability on Amazon? Yeah, this is our daily challenge and the opportunity at the same time. I mean, customer acquisition, you know, and driving traffic and hopefully, you know, getting trial and driving repeat purchase is really important. For us, we've got, you know, all these different brands, all these different products at different stages, you know, on Amazon in both vendor and seller. So we're, we're kind of hybrid right now. And we look at a bunch of metrics to determine that strategy from within each of that Amazon flywheel. We're always looking for profitability when looking at the entire catalog, but we also consider, you know, building the brands with that customer acquisition cost and that lifetime value component. I mean, our goal is always to protect and maintain our top sellers to organically grow the rest of the catalog that are four stars and above, and then launch new items that become top sellers. And of that, you know, we've got a lot of items that consistently have that buy box. A great example of this is we just ran a deal of the day a couple of weeks ago. And looking on the day of that deal, you know, we drove an 80% increase in sales. But the day after the deal, we grew 128% increase in sales for the entire catalog. And then on day three. So if I look at the growth for the brand and light item profitability for an ASIN or product, you know, within that, there's other considerations in looking at that, right? Because You know, Amazon always talks about when they want you to spend money, and there's so many opportunities to spend money on Amazon, it could be very overwhelming, is that to understand that, you know, sometimes you might have to take a loss or break even to kind of get that customer to kind of build those reviews, starting at Vine, something like that, and then advertising. And then sometimes you might have to look at inventory. You know, we're very high on this item, and you know what? Amazon's not going to order more unless we agree to do some of these deals and that profitability may not be as high. However, going longer term and amortizing it to some effect, it is a win for us and ultimately the brand and the catalog overall. Yeah, that's a great point. You need to hold those two concepts in your head at the same time. All right, so last question here. Maybe we can have a bit of fun with this one, but as a marketer, what's been the most interesting or shocking thing about working with Amazon as a marketing and distribution partner? 
<laughs> well, as you know better than anybody, there's never a dull day working in the jungle, also known as Amazon, so aptly named. I mean, the Amazon ecosystem, you know, changes daily, hourly. You know, that A9 algorithm, you know, is a black box, right? Figuring out how you get indexed and ranked and, and searched on the platform is challenging. The whack-a-mole game with the three Ps showing up and the pricing and the resellers and forcing map. It's not a, re a typical retail and distributor account, and that's the good part, and that could be seen as a negative. However, Amazon is here to stay. It's their store. When they decide to move everybody between vendor and seller, you don't have a choice. There's nothing you can do about it. It is what it is. I mean, there's so many options on what Amazon wants you to spend money on. You know, it could be a guide. It could be a deal, a promo. You know, ARA premium is, is a percentage of sales. could be a lot of money for smaller companies. You know, but I think the most important part is that understanding the ROI for your brand and not just Amazon's, you know, return is really important. And I think that's kind of what's become the most interesting is that in a lot of the metrics that they give you, you have to connect the dots to kind of figure out what's really happening because some of those are vanity metrics of impressions and clicks, et cetera. New to brand, that new metric is just outstandingly helpful obviously for us, trying to invest and spend more money on it. But I think just working and knowing that everything's going to change every day is always the fun part of Amazon. That's a great point. And with those new metrics that we're seeing in brand analytics, the new to brand one, the, we've got shopper demographics that we can see now. We can see what keywords, are, what products are converting for which keywords. These are all things. I could not have imagined that we'd get that level of insight into shopper data on Amazon. And this has all come out in the last three months. And it's having the desired effect. I mean, you as a marketer are looking at that data and saying, hey, we can acquire, this is a customer acquisition channel. Let's throw more money at this. And I think that that was their exact plan <laughs> to give up a little bit of data and make it a more compelling channel to spend marketing dollars on. Because I think for a long time, it was really in the sales domain of many organizations. And now it's being viewed as a marketing play as well. That's a great comment. Yeah, I think operationally, Amazon key, right? You got to be clean your inventory, understand those metrics and get your POs in and ship in times, make sure your lead times are good. And Amazon has crazy numbers that you have to hit, you know, 99% accuracy, et cetera. You get scorecards. Those scorecards affect how you're ranked and viewed and served up, you know, on the platform. And now with obviously Google and Facebook having a large majority of the advertising market and Amazon coming you know, hard after them, you know, adding these additional metrics is huge. I mean, keyword harvesting is like gold for us. You know, obviously, as more and more people come on there, those keywords get more and more expensive. But I think segmenting them and understanding some affinities that customer have from a psychographic view, besides demographic, becomes really important on there. And that also helps us complement the strategy that we do on and off of Amazon because we still run AdWords, we still do social, and obviously we do all the AMS, and now testing and learning some DSP stuff too on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's why I think it's been such a difficult platform for many organizations to wrap their arms around because it spans operations, it spans sales, it spans marketing as well. It's sort of a, it's a microcosm of everything that goes on in a business. So to hand it off to someone, to an e-commerce director or just someone who, it, it's no one person's job. It spans so many different disciplines. That's a great point. I mean, it truly is holistic account management on every level. It's a 360 view of the Amazon world and your own business. And you will see very quickly where you need to improve certain areas on Amazon. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us today, Michael. It's great to have you on the show. Now, you've been listening for a little while, so it's great to have to bring a listener onto the other side of the mic. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I will be listening some more and appreciate it.